You cannot be saved and go on doing the same stuff any more than you can shoot an idea with a bullet. Some of us, we hear the gospel and we make a decision. We come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have to answer the next question is, alas, what? What shall we do? Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. Since 1877, Pacific Garden Mission has stood in the city of Chicago as a beacon of hope to those that are on the streets. I spoke to a man yesterday who was incarcerated for over 46 years, had three strokes, and now was sitting in our day room. Yeah, this man was hopeless, this man was homeless, but what this man needed was hope. He needed the gospel of Jesus Christ and he came to the right place. What we want to do now is have Stephen take you downstairs so you can see the humble beginnings of our TV program. We're not a professional studio. This is a group of individuals that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Many of those who work with the TV program one time were homeless themselves, but this is real, and this is what God is doing in our midst in the middle of the city of Chicago. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Phil, and welcome inside Pacific Garden Mission. I'm in the basement walking down the hallway, and we're going to take you inside the Pacific Garden Mission television studio so you can hear about our humble beginnings. You know, one of the exciting things about Pacific Garden Mission is it's a place of change, and I think once you watch this entire program, you're going to see how God was the source of our change. The gospel message is what really does make a difference in our lives. We've got two testimonies followed by a gospel message by Pastor Phil. But before we get into that, I want to just share with you a minute how far we've come with this television program. In 2014, TLN came to us and we had a vision for doing something with the video, videoing the sermons and the testimonies of the stories of people's lives who were changed. I'm one of those stories, Daniel, who's uh, operating the camera right now is one of those stories. And we were excited and inspired after we graduated the one-year Bible program about what God was doing in our hearts and our lives. And we really felt a calling to gather together and record these stories of lives changed by Jesus Christ. And I think you're going to watch this program and you're going to see that God is truly at work here at Pacific Garden Mission. We're going to have Pastor McNeil first, and he has a wonderful testimony because he came here 30-some years ago, and God has really blessed him. He's discipled many people here, including myself, and uh, it's an amazing place, Pacific Garden Mission. So we hope that as you watch these stories of change, you'll be encouraged, inspired, and challenged to let God take you to your highest potential. Sometimes we do get faint-hearted, don't we? Yes. We do, don't we? And, uh, and when that happens, we need to pray. We need to, we, need to, we need to trust the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I thank God for his goodness, for his grace. I thank God for raising up this old lighthouse, amen. March 25th, uh, this year was 40 years ago that I was dropped off at Pacific Garden Mission by Department of Human Service. I was drifting through Chicago, um, strung out on heroin, uh, suicidal, I had nothing whatsoever, not even a toothbrush. And um, I got stranded in Chicago, and so just so that I would have some place to eat and a place to sleep for a few days, the Department of Human Service brought me to Pacific Guard Mission. And the message uh, at Pacific Guard Mission then was the same as it is now. The message is that you must be born again. Yeah. Amen. You must be. Everybody say that with me. You must be born again. Say it like you mean it. You must be born again. But let me tell you something. Behavior modification won't work. You know, you, you can come down to PGM and you can learn how to act for a while while you're here. But that will not sustain you. The Bible says you must be born again. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, 
He cannot see. Listen, until I was born again, I could not see why I needed to do things a certain way. I was under the impression that I could do things any way I wanted to. Well, let me tell you, I had tried that and it had not turned out very well. And it's not turning out too well for some of you either. And there's somebody here tonight who needs to be saved. Jesus said it's a must. Listen, if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. But if you're born twice, you'll only die once. The Bible says you must be born again. I thank God that I was born again March 25th, 1979. Nothing has ever been the same. This November 1st, the wife and I will have been married for 39 years. Last year, last year on August 22nd, almost exactly one year ago, uh, the wife and I retired from the mission. The wife put in 23 years in the unshackled ministry, and I put in almost 33 years. Amen. But let me tell you something. It's all to the glory of God. It was all by the grace and the glory of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. I was saved by the grace of God. But verse number 10 says this, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Listen, once I became born again, I got myself baptized by immersion. I got into a good Bible-believing church, and I'm still there. Young people, listen to me carefully. You cannot be saved and go on doing the same stuff any more than you can shoot an idea with a bullet. You must commit your way to the Lord. Amen. You must commit your way to the Lord. You need to be in a good church. You need to be under a good pastor. You need to be in the word of God every day serving the Lord. That's what it means to be born again. It means to be transformed. It means to be born from above. The songwriter put it this way. Born of the spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, was a stand in his mind. And it's because of that wonderful day when as a sinner I came. I took of his offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me. Oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I thank God for this ministry. I came to Pacific Garden Mission. I had nothing to eat. In fact, I'd never eaten oatmeal in my life. And um, they, they served me oatmeal that very next morning. I'm still eating oatmeal. Amen. Uh, listen, I... I almost ate the handle off the spoon. Amen. The mission provided free meals, free clothing, free everything. And most of all, it discipled me. The mission taught me the word of God. The mission taught me how to behave myself. There's, there were several people that rebuked me several times and told me I didn't know what I was talking about. I thank God for that. Thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you so much. An incredible, amazing story that Pastor McNeil has because we serve an incredible and amazing God. And I'm down in the studio here. It's a humble studio. It doesn't have much. It used to be a converted storage room. We came in here, we cleaned it up, we painted it. And that was the seed that we gave God to use to bloom this ministry. And it's amazing what he's done. We have a few simple cameras. We have a small studio, we have a backdrop here, it's next to a bathroom, which often we hear the toilet flushes and things like that, but yet we get by because the mission is a noisy place. There's no quiet on the set here. We never know what's going to happen that'll uh, interrupt our program. But you know, this room is a picture of the before and after of what happens to persons that come through the doors here because they're often quite in shambles like this room was. And then the final product, even though it's a little cluttered, tends to be a television program that is a testimony of what Jesus Christ is doing in so many lives. And it's down here in this studio where we record some of the most intimate testimonies. As a matter of fact, I think we've recorded several hundred right here in this room. And now we'd like to share Kurt's testimony with you. And he was recorded right here. I came here troubled. 
I was very troubled. To start off with, I grew up uh, in the north suburbs of Chicago here in a middle class family. Uh, I have one older brother. I had an alcoholic mother and an abusive father who was abusive to my mother because she was an alcoholic. That made my life unnerving. I was a young lad, uh, five, six years old. Not knowing what was happening, I would, you know, my mom would stay away a day or two at a time, afraid to come home because my dad was at home with evil in his eyes, wanting to hurt her. I'd be in my room, I'd be, I'd be crying, not knowing, not knowing what, what is happening, what is going on. I just didn't know where to turn or, turn or what to do. But life just kept going on like that. Finally, when I was around eight, my mom divorced my father. Me and my brother stayed with my mom, but she continued to drink. I'm like, well, I thought, you know, Dad's gone now, you don't have to drink anymore. But she was too far gone. Alcohol just really took over her life. By that time, I was in going in junior high now. Uh, that's when I started to get rebellious. Um, I, I don't know what changed in my life, but something did. Something changed drastically. I was getting in trouble in school. Uh, hanging out with the wrong crowds. This is when I started experimenting. Started first with just smoking cigarettes with the wrong guys. Then marijuana came in. When I finally got into high school, that's when the drinking really started hitting me. You know, kegger parties on the weekends. Uh, just uh, all these things just kept going. I didn't have a purpose, I didn't care. I just kept getting in trouble, and the drinking just kept coming more and more. And eventually, it just, it just controlled my life. In my 30s, I started getting seizures. The seizures started coming more frequent. When I came to VGM, I, I was at my wit's end. I was at the end of my rope. I, I didn't know. I didn't know which way else to turn. I believed in God, but I never, how should I say, followed God or believed in, believed in what he might be able to do for me. I remember I came here on my 53rd birthday in 2017. I felt it in my heart. I felt it was Jesus standing right next to me saying, Kurt, we will walk through these doors together, hand in hand, as one. And I just prayed. I'm like, thank you, Lord. I hope this is going to do it for me. I hope this is going to happen for me. Please, Lord, make this happen. I didn't join the program right away. I stayed as an overnight guest for two months. In the two months that I stayed as an overnight guest, I had three seizures. In those two months, of course, I was at the hospital each time. I was afraid of having seizures anymore because who knows when it's going to end my life. I'm like, Kurt, I think it's time to spend a year here. I finally decided to join the program. And so I did, and so I did. I graduated uh, just this past January. After 40 years of smoking and drinking, I'm done. And this, I give all this thanks to the Lord Jesus. I needed a mission, and the mission was my mission. The Lord brought me here. There's no question about it. When I leave here, I've got a lot of years left in my life and I'm not gonna waste them. The door is open for me. I was knocking and Jesus Christ answered that door for me. It can happen to anybody. You just gotta believe, you gotta trust, you gotta have faith. And through God's grace, you can be saved.
you could be born again, the old can go, and the new can come. It doesn't matter what troubles you've had in the past, or what troubles you might even have now in the present. Don't look away from the Lord. Don't look away from the Lord because He is there. He loves you. He loves us. He loves us all. And He loves them. He loves us just who we are. Just who we are. I heard it once said that you can argue many things, but you can't argue with a testimony. And you've seen two testimonies of lives definitely changed by Jesus Christ. And right now you might be thinking, maybe I need to hear more. Well, there's a sermon coming up and I know you'll enjoy it. And if God has spoken to you about coming here, we'd love to have you walk through the doors here at Pacific Garden Mission. The help is free. You can meet with a counselor and new decisions will give you a new life. And the most important decision any of us can make is to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior to be born again. And I know you can find that here. And if you'd like to call us, we'd like to talk to you on the phone. Please get help. Call our number and we'd like to share the gospel with you and find out how we can help you. And if you'd like to come here and see what God is doing, on Saturdays we have tours, followed by the live radio drama Unshackled. Then we have a dinner together in the cafeteria, followed by the television program that you're watching right now. It's called our Praise and Testimony Service. I know you'll come and see what God is doing here. You can meet myself, the president, Daniel, our camera crew, It'll be a wonderful time for you to just see what is happening here. And then feel free to come back and volunteer. We could use your help as volunteers here. And if you love this program, you've enjoyed the testimony, you can go to our website and click on the YouTube button and you'll be able to see all 200 plus episodes. Share them with friends, they'll minister to you and then you can minister to others. And if you'd like a free DVD of this program, there's a episode number on your screen right now write it down and call the number here and we'll be happy to send you a free DVD. Also, if you've enjoyed this program, call your network and tell them how much you've enjoyed it. I know they'd love to hear from you. They've sponsored us and they brought this program to you and we want to continue to share what Jesus Christ is doing in so many lives, including people out of state that have watched this program, that have written letters and sent us cards saying how much it's meant to them to be moved into the kingdom because they've heard the gospel message and received Jesus Christ. And we're excited that you continue to watch here. Did you know that we accept no government funding? Everything done here is by the kind hearts of people that want to come alongside of God's ministry here at Pacific Garden Mission and help men and women come to their highest potential. So won't you take a minute right now and go to our secure website. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly recurring gift. And as you do, know that you'll be helping men and women, people like myself, go from homeless to a home and having a productive role in the kingdom and in society. We want to be role models. We want to change lives. It can only happen with Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and by using the Word of God as our textbook. So thank you very much for being part of this ministry, and we ask God to bless you and keep you as you do. Simply put tonight, the, the title would be, Fiery Darts Are Coming. Last week we left off in the church of Ephesus when it began. The Apostle Paul came down and preached. And those that got saved, and remember we learned last week that the, the city of Ephesus was a city given to idolatry and witchcraft, astrology and, and uh, soothsayers. And many folks that got saved, we saw last week, what did they do with their astrology books. They burned them. They burned them. And there was a moment of excitement when you think of the people in this city when they heard the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. They heard about how they could be set free and they, they saw the reality of Jesus Christ and they burned their books. They were excited. But soon after they, they did that, it seemed as if their world turned upside down. Look, if you would, to chapter 19 and verse 23. In the same time, there arose a no small stir about what? That way. That way. That's what early Christians also were called was that way. 
There are members of that way. And now, no small stir. Imagine a town like Ephesus. And we see these folks that confessed Jesus Christ, and now they, they burn their books. And we learned last week about sometimes we just need to burn our bolts. There's some relationships, and there's some contacts, and there's some uh, situations we just need to let go. And they did in a moment of enthusiasm, but then reality sets in, and all of a sudden the darts start to fly. There's no small stir in the city. And I want to remind you, and last week I referenced the story, but quickly, 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 13, I want to quickly read this story. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. A pagan king wanted to come against one of the prophets of God, and he found out the city that he was staying in, verse 14. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. This man of God is in the city, and yet the enemy has come, and he's compassed the city about with chariots and horses and, and a great host. Look at this here. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? What a question. What shall we do? I can imagine the, the folks in the church at Ephesus after they came to saving faith in Christ. They burned their boats. They burned their books. They... They said goodbye to their former world and now the city is in an uproar and all these things are happening and then the question would logically be, alas, what shall we do? Well, what shall we do about our livelihood? Well, what shall we do about feeding our families? What shall we do about the social relationships that we have had? And many of these folks were going to these pagan temples involved in idolatry and soothsaying and witchcraft. Alas, what shall we do? And for some of us, we hear the gospel and we make a decision. We come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have to answer the next question is, alas, what? What shall we do? What about a job? What about a future? What about my family? What about some of my old friends? What about some of these things? I've, I've burned some of these contacts. I've burned the books. I've burned the boats. I've said goodbye and I was excited and now reality has set in. Alas, what shall we do? Sometimes we look at our situation tonight, hear me, through human eyes as the way things seem to appear. And that's what happened with the servant of the man of God. Situation seemed hopeless. He looked and he saw the chariots and the great host. They're surrounding us. But I love this over here. Look at this here in verse 16. And he answered, fear not. Easy for you to say. Fear not, have you opened up your eyes and seen and I want to tell you tonight that fear not, you're looking at your situation and it seems to be helpless or hopeless. And I want to tell you that there is a God in heaven. And I want to tell you tonight that you can fear not. But if you would stop that verse right there, you would look at this man of God and say, what are you talking about? What, 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 are, you, what are you saying it's easy for you to say, fear not. Look at these people. Look at my situation. Some people, I've had an addiction for so many years. I've not graduated this. I've not been over here. I have no connections. You look at my family. You look at my health and you can tell me, fear not, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Jesus reigns and all that stuff. But look at my situation. But I want to tell you tonight, you're looking at it with the wrong eyes. Because he says, fear not, verse 16, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Look at this. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. 
And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and what? He saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. The army of God was surrounding that place. Forget about the army of the enemy. Forget about the chariots of the enemy. Forget about the horses of the enemy. Forget about the threatenings of the enemy. Because there is more that's with us than that is with them. And I pray tonight that your eyes would be open. It's one thing just to say fear not. But we're talking about the God of the universe that can part a Red Sea, that can feed a nation in the wilderness. It's, it's one thing to talk about fear not, but when we're talking about a God that could protect Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of a fiery furnace, we're talking about a God that could protect Daniel in a lion's den. We are talking about a God. And if your eyes would be open, fear not. You see, it's in that vein, I believe, and, and quickly we'll look again to Acts chapter 19. But turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Now remember, in Acts chapter 19, what church are we talking about that was founded in Acts chapter 19 that we've been looking at? The church where? In what city? Ephesus. Ephesus. Paul comes to Ephesus. They, they get, many get saved. They burn their books. They're excited. And now there's no small stir in the city. There's going to be a riot is going to ensue. There's going to be confusion and chaos everywhere. And the people of God are in the midst of it all. And I'm sure the question, much like Elisha's servant, would be, alas, what shall we do? What is happening? What about our jobs and our social relationships? What about our future? How are we going to eat? What are we going to do? How are we going to live? And it's in that vein in Ephesians chapter 6. So remember, Paul is writing the epistle to Ephesians back to the church at Ephesus. So they want to know what's going on in the midst of their situation. And I love what he says here. Look, if you would, in chapter 6, verse 10, and most of you know this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of what? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the the wiles of the devil. Remember, we turned last week, we studied that was the word schemes. The, the, the devil knows your weaknesses. The, the, the devil knows how he can set a trap. When, when you're fishing, a good fisherman uses different bait for different fish. You use one set of bait maybe for trout, another set for bass, another for muskie. If you're going to fish for salmon in Lake Michigan, you will use a different bait. But a good fisherman will know and he will have wiles. A good hunter knows how to hunt his prey, whether he's a deer hunter, whatever animal he is pursuing. And the enemy, there is an enemy, and I want to tell you tonight, there's an enemy who wants to use his schemes or his wiles to see you defeated, and he knows what bait to use. He says over there again, and he, and he says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against what? Now that's very similar to the scripture we read in 2 Kings. You see, we think our fight is with each other. We, you know, again, it's one thing uh, to talk about unity, but boy, try getting along with people, right? Somebody once said that uh, to dwell with the saints above, that will be glory. But to live with them down here is a different story, amen? And we think that our battle is against human people, but Paul wants to take the, the church at Ephesus to another plan. He wants to remove the veil and said, your battle isn't with these people that are causing the riots. Your battle isn't with these people that want to arrest Paul. Your battle isn't with these people that are coming against this, this little church. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness where? In high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, 
and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the uh, preparation of the gospel of peace. Now look at verse 16. And above all, taking what? The shield of faith. Your, your defensive weapon. Now hear me tonight is the shield of faith. Now look at this here. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of what? Now understand this. Why were the darts fiery? They served two purposes. Number one, to terrify the enemy. You're out at battle and you see not only a dart coming at you, you see a what? A fiery dart. That is terrifying. And that's what the enemy wants to do with you. He wants to terrify you. He wants to cause doubt. But not only that, they also where the cause of the fiery darts was to destroy the shields because many of the shields were made of wood. And if it was just a normal doubt, a dart and you would pick up your shield, the dart would hit the shield and stick in there. But if the dart was a fiery dart, what would happen to your shield? It would burn. And what would you do with it? Throw it down. It would leave you defenseless. So what the enemy wants to do with you is get down your defenses, which is your faith and your trust in Almighty God. And he wants to send those fiery darts like he did to Eve at the beginning. Has God said? I'm not saying, but I'm saying. And, and that's where faith comes. It's believing what God said. And that's why the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the children of Israel could not enter into the promised land, not because of the size of the enemies or the number of the chariots, was because of their unbelief. Jesus said to the disciples, Oh, ye of little what? Faith. Faith. And the enemy wants to send those fiery darts at your shield to lower your defenses so you can be like the servant of Elijah and say, Alas, what shall we do? And isn't that what God wanted to do in the beginning? Has God said that you shall not eat? Has He said that? And it's interesting that, listen to this, when God made everything, everything was good, right? So therefore, when Satan came in the form of a serpent, a serpent initially was good. So what was initially used as good, he turned around and used it for evil. So something that you deem could be good can be turned around and used for evil and be used as a fiery dart to see you destroyed. Listen to this. Archers of the time would light their arrows on fire in an attempt to set wooden shields on fire, thus rob soldiers of any significant protection. You see, and that's what the enemy wants to do with you. He wants you to bring down your defenses. So you now all of a sudden have no more shield and you can be destroyed. You, you know, I think of uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 20, and let me just read this to you. Let me just quote it to you. But it says, But he that received the seed into the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receives it, but yet hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he's offended. Talks about the, the parable of the sower. The one received it and he was excited, but he had no roots. And in a time, what, what I like about this, hear me, Christian. It says, now, now listen to this. He endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises. It says when, it didn't say if. You hear me? It didn't say if persecution, if tribulation arises. It says what? When. So what this tells me is all of us are going to be challenged by, we have an enemy. The enemy is going to use his schemes to see you defeated. And these enemies going to use the schemes, what he wants you to do is hit at your protection, which is your belief in God's promise and in God's word. And he wants to see that destroyed. And this group was excited, it says in the parable of the sower, until tribulation. Alas, what shall we do? And I've been this way my whole life. And things will never change. But did not God promise in his word, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature? 
Behold, all things, right? Didn't he tell us that? If any man is in Christ, he is a what? That's what God's word says, that he will never leave me or forsake me, that he will provide for me. Isn't that what God said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That's my shield. Isn't that what God said? But the tempter come and says, you know what? I don't know. Kind of tough right now. You've never made it before. Look at others. And sometimes we look at other people. Look at this guy tried and look at this girl. But listen, I want to keep my shield up so I can quench. And what the Roman soldiers would do is they would put water on their shields. So they would be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. And my friend, we have the water of the Word of God, whereby when we pick up that shield, we can quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. I like 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange things happen unto you. My friend, here, listen, don't be surprised that you're going through something. Don't be surprised that the phone rang when it did. Don't be surprised at some of the issues you have going on in your own life or the person sleeping next to you that you can't stand. Don't be surprised, he says, hey, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, and that word is used again, which is to try you as though some strange things happen to me. So as soon as I get saved, the church at Ephesus, and we burn our books, man, therefore, everything is going to be okay. Oh, your salvation is secure, but man, things are going to happen. Look real quick in Acts chapter 19. So I believe, again, when you look at verse 23, and there, at the same time, there arose a no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this crafts we have made our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not only alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul persuaded and turned away much people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. All these people, they're not worshiping idols anymore. Therefore, they're not buying our idols. Therefore, our craft is going to come to nothing. We're not making no cash. And now they're going to turn on the people of God. And I'm sure one of the fiery darts, it's the same fiery dart that some of us have. It's a fiery dart of anxiety and fear. The enemy has you in his sights. Let's it go. And it hits you, man. Alas, what shall we do? I'm never going to change. I've always been that way. It's never worked for me. And all of a sudden that fear comes. I love Isaiah 41, 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. He says, I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Fear thou not, I am thy God. Church of Ephesus, the world is turning upside down around you. And now the enemy is throwing a, a, a dart or an arrow of fear and anxiety. What is going to happen? How are we going to feed our children? How are we going to get our home? If we turn away from this silversmiths and these shrines that we've been worshiping, and now all of a sudden everything is going to change, what in the world is going to happen to us? That's why Paul wanted to say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The, the enemy is going to throw fiery darts at you. And some of you tonight, you sit here in fear and anxiety and worry. Well, I love it because Jesus Christ adjust, uh, addresses that in Matthew chapter 6. Quickly look, if you would, there in verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, or, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meats? In the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? 
Number one, don't you know who God is? He's your Father. And as your Father, He has promised to provide for you. And He has the resources to do it. Don't you know who you are? What are we worrying about tonight? My God owns a cattle on a thousand hill. My God, He is my Father. And if God takes care of the birds and the pigeons and the crows in Chicago, they don't have to go to therapy sessions. They don't have to take medication. I don't see any on Canal Street shaking and worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. And if God provides for the pigeons and the birds, cannot God provide for you, O ye of little faith? Church at Ephesus, the fiery darts of the enemy... They're going to come and they're designed to attack your shield and to destroy your protection. What is your protection? Faith, the belief in the Word of God. God promised me this. And he, he goes on and, and, and tells them, it says, and Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O what? O ye of little faith. If God can protect birds... And if God can clothe grass, which is temporary, what about his own children? You see, as a father, my responsibility is for my children. I would feel offended if I'd go down in the kitchen and I'd see my three-year-old child pacing on the floor. I'd say, what are you doing, kid? I'm worried. What are you worried about that I'm going to eat? Listen, I'm your daddy. That's my job. Sit down and get your bowl of cereal out. Amen. And some of you here, you're, you're, you're pacing. And he says, wait a second. Don't you know who your father is? Don't you know what his resources are? And don't you know who you are? If the birds are taken care of, if the grass are clothed, don't you think that he can't take care of you? I remember once when, when Samson Green was on the program, we went to a, a church we were preaching at in Michigan, and... Uh, we were on this boat, we went on some little boat, and the motor broke, so we're twirling around some bay. But I remember, I, clearly he said to me, he said, Pastor, he said, man, I look at my life, and he said, I'm up for 11 attempted murders, uh, incarceration, gang affiliation, don't have any college, all this stuff. He says, when I graduate the program, man, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And then that's worry and fear. And I remember I said to him, the verse here, which was, Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be what? Yeah. I remember I said, Samson, I said, I can't give you the specific. Like on June 24th, you will be high. I said, I can't give you the specific, but I can give you the promise. And since I know the promise, and I know the one who made the promise, I believe no matter what happens that my Father in heaven and your Father would take care of you. And I remember when he graduated here, he had three jobs. Martin Luther King Plaza on the west side. He was coaching basketball at Christian Liberty Academy, and he was still working here part-time. And I want to tell you that my God is faithful. If my God can provide for a bird in Chicago, if my God can provide for the lilies of the field, my God can provide for a man that has 11 attempted murders, no college education, and incarceration, and gang affiliation, my God can't provide. And I look back many Many years and I say you know what he did he did some of you are looking at your situation right now and he's throwing that the dart of fear and anxiety and worry what's going to happen to me I'm not gonna worry I'm just gonna stand up and praise my God because I love the word that's used here the word is father He's not some distant God in the cosmos that's uninterested in what's happening to me in my daily life. He is my what? Father. And we know in the Aramaic it's Abba, which is Daddy. My Daddy has promised to provide for me. And, and again, that's what he says here. Look at verse 32. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Not only... Is he God? Not only does he have all power, 
He has all knowledge. As you are sitting here tonight, my Father knows what your needs are. He knows your children. He knows your bank account. He knows your educational background. He knows your skill level. He knows your family, and he knows where you were. My God has promised, and that's what he says here, your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the what? Man, that seems crazy. I got these bills due, man. man I, I have not, I, I, who's ever going to take care of me? He says, no, 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 no. But you have a job, you're a job, and your responsibility is what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, what? That's my shield of faith. Anytime that I get discouraged, Matthew 6, shield of faith. God, you know I have need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. Shield of faith. The enemy comes with a fiery dart and he wants to see you destroyed. Shield of faith. Man, God can't take care of you. Nothing will ever change. You'll never make it. You'll never do it. Why do you ever want it? Well, I pick up my shield of faith. My heavenly Father that takes care of the birds, my heavenly Father that takes care of the lilies, He can take care of His eternal child. Hallelujah. He is my God. Fear not. That's what my God says tonight. So quickly again, we see, I believe, one of the fiery darts in this church was worry and anxiety. Another one, not only was that what we see here, not only emotionally were they filled with worry, I believe, socially there was always the question about people. What about these attacks? What about these attacks? Again, in verse 26, Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people. Now they're slandering Paul. And, and then later on they're going to bring Paul in before all the people. Now, what's going to happen socially? How do we engage? And some of us are afraid. The Bible says, do not fear man. Don't fear what man can do to you. When I burn my boats, I am not going to live a life of worry and anxiety and fear. When I burn my boats, I'm not going to worry about social relationships because my God will take care of me. And many times, hear me tonight, those people that seem so interested in you, many times are only interested in you for what they can get from you, because when you have a moment of need, where are they? Right? Some of you guys talk about, man, he's my guy. Where's your guy now? Where's your guy now? You're my guy. Where you at, guy? Oh, I thought you were going to take care of me. I'm going, to, I'm going to back you up, and I'm going to be there for you. And now here I am in the midst of need, and where are you? Man, I don't care about nobody else. I am serving my God. Amen? Amen. And I believe, I look at this in verse 28. When they had heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, the whole city... They cried out, and great is uh, Diana of the Ephesians, verse 29. And the whole city was filled with what? Confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, the men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. Now they, they caught these people and they, they ran into the theater there. And they thought everything was going to fall apart. Fiery darts. What's going to happen now? Your guys are being arrested. Paul's being attacked. The city's in an uproar. They're crying out about great as Diana. What's going to happen now? Christian, my friend, as we're here tonight and as we close and we'll pick it up next week, I want to challenge you. You need to see more than what you see in front of you. There's a whole other world out there that you, don't, you and I sometimes don't even understand. We have an enemy intent on our destruction. And this enemy, the moment we burn our boats... He's going to send those arrows our way. Expect trouble. Don't sit here and say, man, ever since I made that decision to, boy, everything's falling apart. Don't consider it strange. You are a target. But what I need to do is pick up that shield and take God at his word and fear thou not. I am with thee, I am thy God. Amen. Amen. Let's have every eye closed, every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed.
So you're here tonight, and maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So, Pastor, tonight I, I want to be saved. You see, the Bible says, For as it is appointed unto man once to die, then after this comes the judgment. Listen, we're all going to die one day. It's a fact. There's not one of us that's going to be sitting in this room 100 years from now, 70 years from now. We're all going to die. But the question is, what is after death? The Bible says, for as it is appointed unto man once to die, then after this comes the judgment. So what this tells me is after death is something, after death is judgment. Judgment of what? My sin. When I stand before a holy God and the wages of sin is death and the second death is the lake of fire, hell is real. So if I stood before God and he opens up the books, and he sees everything that I have ever done, and the wages of sin is death, then I am lost. But the good news is God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to pay that wage whereby you can be forgiven. And tonight, if you repent of your sin and come to Jesus Christ, God will forgive you and pardon you. Yes, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Praise God, Jesus Christ was judged on the cross for my sin. If you're here tonight and say, Pastor, I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. Raise up your hand. I want to pray for you. I'm not talking church tonight. I'm not asking you to join anything, sign anything, give anything. You might just say, Pastor, I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. Please pray for me. Raise up your hand all throughout the auditorium. Hallelujah. Those of you that have raised your hands, I want you to pray with me in the quietness of your own heart. Pray something simple. Say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but tonight I call upon you. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin, was buried and rose again. I accept you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that you were encouraged by those testimonies, and I pray that you were challenged by the message. And as we close, I'm not here to sell you a CD or have you buy a book. I want to challenge you with your soul's salvations. As you have heard that there are fiery darts that will be shot at us, the reality is all of us one day will face God. I was reading in the scripture the other day where the Bible says, prepare to face thy God. Those are sobering words because in reality, all of us are going to stand before a holy God. You might ask the question and say, well, if I stand before God, how will I be judged? You won't be judged by how good you are. You'll be judged by God's righteousness that the Bible says all of us fall short. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, it's not a matter of you being better than the next person. It's about you comparing yourself with God's righteousness and all of us fall short. And I wanna challenge you today because the Bible plainly tells us, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The most precious commodity that you have is your soul. And make certain that when you meet your God, that you are prepared. And how do I become prepared? Making sure that you know Jesus Christ is your savior. You see, just as sure as the Bible says, we've all sinned and the wages of sin is death, the good news is Jesus Christ died for those sins. So when you stand before God, if you accept Jesus Christ, you will not be judged for your sins because Jesus Christ was judged for your sins when he died on the cross. Here's the gospel in a very simplistic form. Sin has to be paid for because God's holy. It has to be paid for. One of two ways. Number one, yourself in a place called hell. Or number two, believing Jesus Christ paid your hell when he died on the cross. When Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken, so you will never have to be. He, the innocent, died for the guilty, so the guilty can be set free. Why don't you come today and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your sin bearer and as your savior? Why don't you cry out to God right now so you can be prepared? Pray a simple prayer. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner, but today I cry out to you. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin, was buried and rose again. 
I accept you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you trusted Christ, why don't you let us know? If you just enjoy this program and it has been a source of encouragement to you, why don't you write us? In my hand, I have a letter from Mary, and Mary writes, Dear Pastor, thank you. Thank the Lord for you administering to the needs of the people. I am an 82-year-old widow watching the program on Saturday nights. What a blessing for the people to be under the word and to have a place of refuge. PGM is a blessed place. Keep up the good work and God bless you and your staff. What an encouragement. Thank you, Mary. And if others are out there being encouraged, let us know. Let us know what God is doing in your life. God bless you and thank you for watching. If he could save me, he could save anybody. And then he put a new song in my heart. And now I use what little bit, a little bit of talent that he gave me. I use it for him. Make sure I can remember the words. Up on a hill they called Calvary, oh, he bled and died. For you and for me, he is true, he is love, and he loves you so much. And up on the hill and up on that tree, oh, side was pierced. You and for me, oh, the blood and the water flowed in the price for our sins was paid. And oh, Jesus, I need you so, Jesus, don't let me go. I need you so, Jesus.